let us continue with the discussion of our immunology lectures in today's lecture we are going to specifically talk about immunodiffusion i hope you remember that when antigen and antibody bind with each other in the proper concentrations they result in the visible precipitate a when the antigen is soluble and that precipitate is because of the lattice formation as shown in the diagram with this background information we will learn the new concept called immunodiffusion now in general when we talk about diffusion for example if i tell you that a drop of ink is mixed with a glass of water what do you imagine you imagine that the color of the ink will spread throughout the water isn't it why it is so because the particles the color has diffused across the medium this in this case it is water liquid medium let me give you another example if i spray a room freshener in one corner of the room the particles travel across the air and in the other corner of the room after some time the smell is felt why it is so because the perfume the fragrance particles have traveled and they have tried to diffuse across the space in the room in the air medium even evenly so this particular phenomena of even distribution of particles across the medium would be commonly called as diffusion when i say immunodiffusion it relates with the immune components and naturally in this case i mean antigens and antibodies so when i say they they diffuse across i need to give them a medium to diffuse and that medium is generally the gels gels made up of agar or more purified form agarose so as the diagram depicts here you can see that red colored zone is the antigen whereas the blue colored zone is antibody and when uh, they are put into wells which are bored into agar they are going to di get diffused across the agar because agar will have pores into it and as the antigen and antibody diffuse across each other somewhere their concentrations are going to be equivalent so wherever there is zone of equivalence seen you can see the precipitation line observed so using this particular principle we will have four different methods to be learned about out of which two are extensively used in today's world in research institutes let us understand them one by one precipitation can also be done in liquids however the methods in today that we are using okay the methods that are being used extensively generally involve gels and not the liquids there are reasons to it because after diffusion if we want to get the components of immune material uh, immune components back then liquid medium will not be of any use therefore gels are preferred so before i go to the terminologies of this let me tell you precipitation reactions generally involve two important components one is how many reactants are diffusing okay whether it is only antigen diffusing or whether it is only antibody diffusing or whether it is both that are diffusing across the gel for example as you can see in the diagram here in the circular part you can see that the antibodies in blue color they have shown all over the circular part however the red colored antigen is shown only in the center and across the that center radially the antigens are diffusing but they have not yet gone outside to the gray circle and why it is so because antigens were added to the centrally bored well and those antigens diffused across uniformly so who who got diffused in this particular picture you can see that only antigen was diffused right so this will be called as single immunodiffusion whereas the diagram below you can see that on one well 
it is antigen who is diffusing and on other well uh, you, you have added antibody which is also diffusing so basically you have both antigen and antibody diffusing in the gel and forming a precipitin line in the center since the two components are flowing or diffusing through the gels we say this is double immunodiffusion okay so we have two immunodiffusions single immunodiffusion or double immunodiffusion then there comes another aspect wherein we consider the direction of diffusion okay we consider the direction of diffusion if the components are flowing in one particular direction they will be called as linear diffusion so i would rather say that it's a single immunodiffusion in a linear direction we will do take examples to understand this in detail but when the component dissolve uh, diffuse across the gel in all possible directions we call it radial immunodiffusion okay just as in this case we had this antigen which diffused across in all directions and therefore we said it is a radial immunodiffusion let us see different methods one by one so let us understand the first method which is called as single diffusion so it's a single immunodiffusion in one direction this name has been suggested because it is the only one component that is getting diffused in the gel and that is antigen and that flows in one direction now how do you control the direction that it is flowing through if imagine if you keep that component in a test tube right if you keep that component in a test tube and under the gravitational force you have that component diffusing in the test tube uh, this particular method is called as odin because he was the first who pioneered uh, this particular technique and he used gels for the precipitation for the first time so if you understand in this particular diagram we can see two different methods but let us for the time being understand only the left half of the uh, diagram here you can see a test tube has been taken and in the test tube uh, there is a layer okay this particular layer is uh, shown with a uh, you know slanted lines right so those lines represent as you can see here antibody in agar gel so the agar gel is filled almost 3/4 of the test tube sometimes even more than that and there is a small layer of antigen that is put on the surface on the top of the uh, agar gel so there is no uh, no requirement of antibody to diffuse because antibody itself is in agar but who is going to diffuse antigen is going to diffuse and you have also shown the direction of the antigen in the tube antigen is going to flow down the tube and as antigen flows down there will be a point where there will be zone of equivalence observed and precipitin band would be observed this kind of technique is called single immunodiffusion in one direction single because only antigen is diffusing and one direction because it is diffusing only in downward direction on the same lines if we immediately look at the right hand side of the diagram you will understand that there is something called as double diffusion here why it will be called as double diffusion because both antigen and antibody are going to get diffused for this particular protocol we need to reshuffle the arrangement uh, the way we add antigen and antibody what we are going to do is we are going to uh, you know generate antibody in agar gel again however we are not going to fill the 3/4 of the tube we are going to fill only 2/3 th uh, of the tube then the 2/3 of the tube above above that layer would be just a plain agar which will not contain either antibody or antigen and like earlier method we will top that layer with another uh, layer of antigen uh, that will be highly concentrated so what will happen is antigen will move downward and antibody will move upward through the agar which is plain right now 
After some point of time, we will understand precipitin band. We will see that precipitin band is getting formed in the plain agar. Why? Because both antigen and antibody diffuse across each other and they uh, form the line of precipitin wherever we had zone of equivalence obtained. This kind of method is called as double diffusion and it was given by Oakley Fultroff and therefore the name. Now if we understand the third method which is a radial immunodiffusion in that we have something called as Mancini method. Now Mancini method was given by scientist Mancini and it is also called as radial immunodiffusion. Again it is a single diffusion meaning only one component is going to get diffused and generally when we have one component that is diffusing it is antigen. So where is the other component? It will be in the gel. As you can see on the uh, in the diagram on the screen that you are having uh, many different wells uh, uh, in, in the gel. I mean you are going to collect this, you are going to take a slide, you are going to fill that slide with a gel, okay, you allow that gel to settle down and then you are going to bore the wells. Of course, the gel contains antibody already and when you bore the wells, in each well, you will add different concentrations of the antigen. As the antigens diffuse across, you will realize that the precipitin bands are formed as a circle. And because the diffusion is radial, the circular precipitin bands are observed. The diameter of the bands directly proportional to the concentration of the antigen. Higher the concentration, more uh, the diameter of the precipitin band is observed. So imagine we have known antigenic concentrations like that shown in the diagram on the right hand side. We have a neat antigen. Antigen diluted 1 is to 2, antigen diluted 1 is to 4 and antigen diluted 1 is to 8. So since 1 is to 8 is the highest dilution, we have got the least uh, diameter for that antigen in the, around that well. Whereas the neat antigen has given us a very prominent and a bigger uh, diameter as compared to others. When we try to plot a graph of antigenic concentration um, and diameter, uh, you know, generally the square of the diameter is taken in order to get a linear graph. So when we plot diameter square, whose diameter? The precipitin band's diameter, right? And that diameter square versus antigenic concentration, if that graph is plotted, you get a linear graph. Using this linear graph, we can easily calculate what is the calcul uh, what is the concentration of the antigen in unknown sample. So this is how Mancini's method is really helpful. This method is also called as single diffusion and radial diffusion. But single and double are very rarely used words. So we generally say that it is radial immunodiffusion. It's a quantitative test. If more than one, one ring appears in the test, which could be a very practical uh, problem when we would perform the test, more than one antigen or antibody reactions have occurred could be the right conclusion for such problems. This could be due to mixture of antigens or antibodies or some interfering molecules. This test is commonly used for cl in clinical laboratory for determination of immunoglobulin levels in patient samples. As you can see it in the diagram, you have got 650 and 1750 mg per dl. These concentrations are known and 1, 2, 3 concentrations are not known. So what has happened? We have plotted a graph, a linear graph and on the graph we have uh, 1, 2, 3 concentrations also. If we got, uh, you know, taking the diameter of 1, 2 and 3, we can extrapolate it and we can find out what is the antigenic concentration in sample 1, sample 2 and sample 3. It is always uh, better to square, to take the square of the diameter for the accuracy purpose.
and then we will learn about the last important method that is double diffusion in radial direction, meaning two dimensions. This method is called as outer Looney's method because of the uh, concept given by outer Looney. In this method, what we generally do is we have three wells bored in the on in the gel which is placed on the slide. And generally this method is used for uh, detecting the similarities between the antigens. So we have fixed amount and fixed or uh, known antibody to be used. And then we have a known antigen or commercially available antigen for it. Now we want to test whether a person serum has similar kind of antigens or not. We may add patient serum in the third well of the uh, of the experiment. As you can see it in the diagram, the two antigenic wells are next to each other, while the antibody well is in the you know at an angle of 60 degrees to it. Basically, the three wells are bored in a way that they will constitute the corners of the equilateral triangle. In case of identical antigens, you get something ca called as an arc at the junctions. As you can see in the first diagram, antibody is alpha A, alpha AB and alpha AB in the three conditions. However, if you understand the antigen that we have added, this is A and this is also A, meaning the color represents the similarity between antigens just for our understanding purpose. Since the two antigens are identical here, you have got an exact arc. And this arc is because of the precipitin band. This particular line is formed because of the antigen-antibody interaction between these two. And this particular line is formed because of the interaction between these two. However, because the antigens are same, okay, this line will not exceed and they will be exactly forming an arc. In the second case, however, you can see that one antigen is A and other, another antigen is B. And because these antigens are totally not identical to each other, they are totally different from each other, both the lines have exceeded and you've got a cross-like mark at the junction. So when you get cross-like mark, you understand that the two antigens are separate or different from each other. Now when uh, consider the third situation where the second antigen is partially identical to the first antigen. In that case, you can see that only one line has given extension, which we call it as spur. So, uh, fused lines with a spur uh, helps us to understand that there is partial identity between antigens. In this way, using outer Looney's method, we can demonstrate uh, whether the antigens are similar in the patient as that of commercially used antigen. We have been using this method in diagnosis of smallpox, fungal antigens and many, many other antigens can be tested using these methods. I hope today's lecture has made you uh, understand the importance of immunodiffusion and different kinds of methods based on the principle of immunodiffusion. Basically, be it a single or double, radial or linear, this particular concept of immunodiffusion is extremely important to, to be discussed about when we talk of antigen-antibody reaction.